Hello everybody and welcome to the next compiler demo. It's been a long time since I did one because I was shipping a video game and that <laughs> tends to take a lot of work, uh, but that's out now and I've had some spare time to go back and work on the compiler. And what I'm going to show uh, tonight I think is really cool and it's the sort of thing that almost no languages do, and then the, the languages that have done this are very lacking in other areas. Um, but what I'm going to show is a straightforward extension of what we did last time, and it's been a while, so I'm going to do a quick review of what we showed last time, and uh, talk about how that works, and then I'll show uh, how that leads into this time. So, when uh, last we met, well for several demos now, We've had this um, this little simple video game demo. In fact, actually, I showed this during the very first demo, and it's we've modified it a little bit, but you know, it's basically the same thing. So it's just a simple little program that serves as a way to goof around and test things, right? So I just wanted to show this again. This this should be very familiar to anyone who follows the stream. All right, I died. Cool, right? So now, last time we showed uh, an interesting uh, meta program that was inserted into there, or a compile time uh, program that acted as a compiler extension for building this program, right? And we're going to go really quickly back over how this works, but basically what we did is we turned on this go bananas hook, which uh, brings in a great deal of compile time code uh, to give us a lot of information about what we're compiling and just do other crazy things. So here, we're about to run the compiler. Now, everything that happens here is in the compiler. Again, this is, people who've been following the stream know this very clearly by now because we've showed it several times. But just as a review, right, this isn't a runtime program yet. This is the compiler running. So it pops open a window, it's drawing to OpenGL, and we're, we're getting all this information, and the compiler is not actually this slow. It compiles very quickly, actually, but I, I rate limited it to get this visualization. We're playing streaming audio and decompressing OGS all in the compiler, right? It really beats const expert in C++ or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I have this cool visualization where as I compile different procedures, I'm dropping them in here, and I can you know, I can click around and uh, it's actually, as things are still coming in, it's a little bit because uh, things are moving around, but I can click on like do glyph substitutions and there it is in my text editor on the left, right? So uh, this is pretty cool and it's all running in the compiler and it's an arbitrary amount of code. Like we can make this as big as we want. We can make it a million lines, right? It'll still work because it's exactly the same programming language that we run at runtime. Um, okay, I hate I hate to turn this demo off because it's so cool. Oh, and we can do other stuff like, uh, okay. <laughs> I presumed it might be too loud. How's that? Is that better? Is that better? All right. Anyway. So we have different modes of visualizing what we just compiled, and um, we get all this information. We, we basically get complete information about what we're compiling, right? We went through all that last time. Uh, we can stat files, you know, we can see what we outputted and all that good stuff. Let's talk for a minute about how that works in a diagrammatic way. Oh, I gotta, let's exit this. Um, oh, and when we exit that, it then goes on and finishes compiling and, you know, actually it finished compiling while we were running it, but then the compiler exits and we're back to normal. All right, so here's how uh, we think about compilers. Let me pause for a second and make sure that you can see this whole picture because you never know what's going to happen on the stream. Okay, cool. So. Hmm. You know, generally you think of a compiler as working like this. You've got a source code for your program, right? It just goes into the compiler, which is a magical black box or a light blue box in this case, and out comes an executable, which is what people will run, right? So for this particular compiler, we can zoom in on this picture a little bit, right? Where we say the source code goes in, and it goes into some pipeline where several transformations are performed on the program, 
and then the execu executable comes out this end, right? So what do we do? We parse source code, then we resolve names and infer types, uh, right? And then we figure out the sizes of things, like if there are structs containing substructs and whatever, that all gets figured out. Um, and then we generate bytecode for the program, and then if we need to run some of that bytecode, for example, uh, for that big uh, compiler extension program that we just ran, then we run it when it gets to this stage, and then eventually we output it, which currently means uh, outputting to C and then compiling the C program, but uh, eventually it'll be writing machine code directly. Uh, and then we get the executable out that end. Okay, so for the purposes of what we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to be talking about this compiler pipe in the middle, so we're just going to get rid of these boxes at the beginning and end. So your program is going through this thing. Now the design uh, that we demoed last time works like this. Uh, after you pass through the infer phase, so your, your code's been parsed, it's been inferred. Oh, one thing that I should mention, uh, back when I said that the source code goes through all this, it doesn't do it in giant chunks the way it does in languages like C++, for example. Um, you know, in C++, you sort of operate on one file at a time, and you'll parse the whole file, like a compilation unit it's called, right? So in this language, the compilation units are very small. They're just at the level of single declarations, or uh, at most, the body of one procedure, right? So. Uh, all sorts of littler things flow through this pipeline from beginning to end. Now what happens is we parse them, right? They get inferred so we know the types and where any names bind in the program and anything like that. Uh, then we have this little tap where the user level program can peek. All this stuff that gets inferred gets translated from the data structures in the compiler to the data structures at user level. And we'll probably look at those again uh, in a little bit today. Uh, again, we looked at those last time, though, and uh, this slideshow thing keeps making my cursor disappear. It's really annoying. Um, I'm going to keep moving it like this so it doesn't disappear. So we have a little tap that translates those data structures, and it passes them to user code in a message loop. So this user code is running in a loop, and every time it sees a message, it does whatever it wants, right? So uh, when we were getting messages saying, hey, I compiled a new procedure, we... Uh, just look at the size of the procedure and the name and some other things and what, what, what file and line it's from and that's where we got all that information to populate those graphics, right? And then after we get the message, the compiler then goes on and it just passes it through these subsequent phases. Okay, so that's how last time's demo worked. This time we're going to add something new where we get information after the infer stage and it gets passed to our user code if we want to, we don't have to, we can just behave as before if we want and let the compiler continue and compile things. But if we want to, we can intercept any code that is handed us to the compiler, we can modify that code, and we can pass it back as if it was parsed from source code. But we don't actually modify source code, we're modifying the syntax tree of our program, right? So it's a very easy and quick modifications. We pass them back to the infer stage, and then our modified thing then comes all the way through this pipe, including we'll get a message about the modified thing, uh, but then it'll keep going and run to the output. Okay, so I want to make a point about this, though. Why are we doing this here? Uh, for example, a lot of languages, uh, say, for example, Lisp or something like that, has, that has code modification works like this where it's before you know the type of anything. And in Lisp, maybe you never know the type of anything, so this whole box doesn't exist. None of these boxes exist, right? But whatever. Um, other languages that do similar things with macros, usually you would have a macro phase here where some user macros are defined, and after you've parsed the code, they get cranked through macros before you know the types of things. Um, and we may do this later because there's a set of things you can do here that you can't do here but I wanted to do this because this is where you're maximally powerful in terms of knowing the most about the program every identifier has been resolved you know where it maps to you know the program as you receive it is correct and you know the types of everything you can verify that if something is referencing a struct called hello that it's your struct hello and not a different struct hello from a different module that also got imported right all that stuff you know for sure at this point so if you want to make a very robust statically typed program this is how you do it 
So this is what we're going to demo today. As a possible future extension, we could do this also with the same structure we're going to show today. It would be a very straightforward thing. And you could do this if you wanted to, say, change the types of things. So for example, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into this detail at the later. later. Uh, let me just demo the thing so we have something concrete to talk about. And then if I forget, remind me at the end, and we'll talk about the limitations of what you can do in this infer scheme versus what you could do in the parse scheme. Do I have another slide? No, that's it. All right. So um, let us start out by uh, doing some simple things. So any, anyone uh, who got the source code for this time can follow along. First, we're going to compile. Um, first, we're going to compile a very simple program. Oh, someone's asking, why are we doing this tap before I figure out the sizes of things and not after? Um, it's arbitrary. You could do it after, you could do it before. I might have lied, I might actually do it after. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's trivial to put it in either place. So uh, we will go into the tests folder. I hope I didn't rename this stuff. I kind of cleaned it up. I might have made a folder called demos instead of tests, whatever. But there's a folder, uh, there's a file called demo, and it's this very trivial program, right? Uh, it's got a factorial function. It's got main, which calls factorial in two different ways. And it's got this function foo. We're not even using foo, so I'm just going to comment that out even. That's if you wanted to run this at compile time. I don't know why I left that in there. Let's just delete all this. So uh, we've just got a main and a factorial function and that's it. And why did it? I don't think I need sort either. Anyway, uh, let me. All right, so we're compiling that and we're, we've uh, built it and now I'm going to run it. Whoops, it's in tests, sorry. So it does exactly what we say, like f is the factorial of 3, which is 6, right? That's 3 times 2. Basically, to be, to be very uh, pedantic about this, because this is going to be relevant to what we do in a second, this factorial is a recursive procedure. So we say, what's factorial of 3? We call this with 3, right? We say, OK, it's not less than or equal to 1, so it's 3 times factorial of 2. So we recurse. We get, at, wait, what's factorial of 2? Well, it's 2 times factorial of 1. When we get factorial of 1, we say, OK, return 1. So we go 3 deep in recursion on calling this routine. And we come up with the answer 6, because that's 3 times 2 times 1, right? And then we do that again with 5, and that's 120, right? That's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Uh, every language has factorial examples, because it shows recursion and whatever. So this is not supposed to be exciting yet. Now, last time we showed about uh, using uh, a message loop in an external program uh, to control the compilation of, of the other program. And we're going to do that again. And you could put pack all this stuff into one file if you wanted to. But for now, I'm keeping it in two separate files to keep everything maximally clear. So uh, I've got this file set up that's got a bunch of uh, tricks that we can do. And let's look at what it does for a second. When we start up this file, it's going to run this thing build. And build is going to uh, do this stuff where we say, OK, for our current workspace that we're running, there's no executable. So we don't want any of the junk in this file to go into the output program. But then what we're going to do, so depending on what version of the demo we run, which I'll switch around in a second, we do some stuff here that we'll get to later. But then what we do is we make a blank workspace, which is like a place where we manipulate a program. Uh, we say, OK, we're making an executable called demo at this path. And you know, we just set those build options. And um, then here's the message loop. So we say, OK, we're going to begin intercepting messages from the compiler. And then we loop around in this loop until we get a complete message. Right? So we wait for a message. If it's null, just keep going and try again. If it's not for the workspace that we're trying to compile, keep going, because it might be for us. Right? We might get messages about our own workspace. But this loop just wants to operate on the other program. So uh, 
then uh, we call this procedure build steps, which for now, if I don't have any of these options turned on, probably doesn't do anything. So what I'm just going to do is uh, I'm going to run setup now instead of demo. And it says, hey, we made this workspace for the demo. It's number two. Uh, and everything else is the same as before. So I can run test demo.exe and it still works. It does exactly the same thing. All we're doing is we're inserting a bunch of stuff around that that let us control how it gets compiled, right? Again, so far, nothing new. It's all just a refresher. Here's where it gets cool. Uh, let's start modifying the syntax tree of that program. So I'm going to turn on this thing called doing version A. Let's search for what that does. So remember when we call build steps, that gets a message for everything that gets uh, pumped through our message loop, which is just notifications about all kinds of things that can get compiled. And so because we could be talking about anything in the program, we want to be picky. So we're checking only for code that's been type checked. So for example, we would get messages about what files we open and close, so we're ignoring those, right? So we only care about code that's type checked. Let's look at the declaration. If it's not a procedure body, we're not interested. If it's something that we already modified, we're also not interested, right? Remember I said, as things go around in that loop, we'll get messages for them multiple times. We only want to modify the code once for this particular thing that we're doing, right? And then we're saying, hey, uh, let's only modify things in this file demo because if you go back and look at the demo, um, it's importing all these modules and we'll actually get messages for everything in all those modules. So like when we compile print or cosine or whatever, we're going to get messages for all that stuff. And we're just saying for now, okay, look, we're only interested in messing with the things in this file demo. All right. Given that we pass all that, we get the struct for this procedure. And let's just look really quickly at what that is. So in modules compiler, we say code procedure, whoops, procedure. So that's basically a struct that has all kinds of things, right? These, these all inherit from a base node. Uh, it's got a block of statements and a block of types if, uh, if it's a polymorphic procedure. Um, it's got the arguments that get passed. Those are a bunch of declarations and return values and the name of the procedure. And then uh, a declaration representing the header because internally there's a header and a body for every procedure. Um, and just some, some other information, you know, that you might use. If it's a foreign procedure implemented in C, you get a flag for that. If it's a compile time procedure, you get a flag for that. So, um, cool. We get all this information. What are we going to do with it? What we're going to do is we're going to synthesize a print statement and we're going to jam it on the front of that procedure. Okay. And the first thing that we're going to do here is a very, um, it's a very precise, but maybe very cumbersome way of modifying code. And then we'll show how to make it simpler. But I want to, I want to do this just so that there's no magic and you can see exactly how it works. And then we'll do some more sophisticated things in a more abbreviated way. Okay. So we're going to make this array of new statements that, you know, every command in the language is a statement. We're going to make an array of statements that's going to replace the old array of statements on any procedure that flows through here. And we're going to make the first one a print statement. So we'll look at this function in a second, but we're just going to make a print statement, right? Um, we're going to add that to this array of new statements. Then everything that came in in that procedure in the message also gets added, right? So we're f doing a for loop over all the statements in the blocks procedure. And we're adding all of those as well, right? And then we poke that back on the block. We say, this is your new array of statements is everything that was there before plus our print statement at the beginning, right? We just print to the user that we modified that procedure with whatever the name was. And then we tell the compiler that we want to modify this procedure. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's look at what that does, I think, before we go on. So we're recompiling the program. Now, when we compile, this is compile time code. So when we compile, it will tell us that we modified the procedure. Okay. Right. So it tells us we modified factorial and we modified main and then we compiled. So that's cool. Now, what did we do? Right. Let's take a look. Uh, oh, it's in tests. Well, uh, 
we jammed in a print statement, and w again, in a second, we'll look at how this happened, but we jammed in a print statement that tells us that we're entering that procedure, right? The A here means that we're doing version A of this modification. So at the beginning of factorial, we inserted a print that we're entering factorial, and at the beginning of main, we inserted a print that we're entering main. So now you can see what our program's doing, right? We enter main once, and then let's go back to the demo, right? We call factorial of three, and you can see that we recurse into factorial three times to get our answer, right? And then we call factorial five, and we rehearse five times to get our answer, right? So let's look at make print statement. Um, what did we do? And again, this is going to be more laborious than it needs to be. Um, ooh, and I've got notes here that I want to clean up these casts, but I didn't do it before the demo. Anyway. Um, so what do we do? Well, we want to literally make a function call that says something like this, print a entering main, right? Except we want to make it an argument like this, new line, comma, uh, name, right? We basically want to generate a line of code that looks like that, uh, except instead of name, we're just going to do something like this. Right? So we want to insert that as the first line on the front of the procedure. Now, you might be asking, why do you actually want to insert this? That seems like a really dumb thing to insert, but we're leading to something. This is going to be good. Just, you know, we're doing this step by step. So, uh, we're basically synthesizing something that looks like this. So we're building a procedure call node. Um, we say that the kind of it is a procedure call. We need to set the expression of what procedure we're calling, and that's this identifier print, right? So that builds this. And we're just, we're just getting this memory wherever we want to, because the memory only has to live long enough to tell the compiler about it, right? So we're just saying new to construct all these nodes. You can do it with your own custom allocator. In fact, new will call your custom allocator if you set it anyway. Um, so we say the function is print. This, of course, could be, instead of an identifier, it could be a much more elaborate expression because it's an abstract syntax tree. You could put anything there, right? So we make the procedure call. And then uh, we make a string. Um, oh, actually, I'm not doing this. Actually, I'm actually generating this. So we've only got one argument. I'm building the string here, right? With, with a different print function or a similar print function. I'm building the string, and then I'm calling something that says make string literal. And let's look at that. Because a string literal isn't just a string, it's a node that inherits from the same base class as everything else. And it says, OK, this is a literal, it's a string, and then the string value field is s, whatever string you passed. right? So we made that node, um, and then uh, we make a statement because this whole print thing is one statement. So we make a statement and then we return that statement. And that statement is what allows us to insert the print statement or insert the thing into the procedure. So again, you don't need to follow this 100% if you're not totally getting it. The basic idea is we just set up some nodes that represents a call to a print function with a string that we customize for every procedure. Because remember, it's, it's got the name of the procedure in it. Um, we're going to do this in a more uh, finessed way in a second. But basically, uh, that gives us this. Now, this is uh, not that easy to edit, right? If, if you want to just play around and write a bunch of code, this is not that fun because you have to figure out what is the syntax tree representing the code that I want to make. If I wanted to insert 100 lines of code into a program, this would be not a very... Uh, fun way to do it. It would be a very labor intensive way to do it and it would be easy to make mistakes, right? So let's look at version B. First, let me make sure I didn't mess up something by editing the file. All right. So I didn't. Okay. So let's go to version B. Uh, let's look at what it does first. It's going to do a slightly more involved. See that we're modifying with version B. We're printing out both of those. And we run it. This time, it's printing stuff on enter and exit of the procedure, and it's indenting right in and out. So we can sort of get this visual representation of how far into the function we've gone every time. So how are we doing that? Well, um, first, uh, well, let's 
let's start by looking at the string since we're here. First, we're adding some stuff to the program itself at the global scope. So we're saying, hey, we want a variable to track the indent level. So let's just make a signed 64-bit integer in the global scope that we're going to write to from all these procedures, right? So that's going to track how far, how many spaces we print. Um, and then we need print and we need uh, basic, which is a sort of basic element in the standard library. We need those, so let's add those to the program in case it doesn't have it. Version A should have done that too, and maybe I do if I forgot to do it, because um, version A called print as well, and if your program didn't import print, you'd be in trouble. We don't have to worry about duplicate imports because imports get deduplicated. It's not a problem. Someone's asking, what's the done keyword? This is a here string like you have in shell uh, languages. This basically says we're starting a string and then everything up until the word done is that string. So we can use quotes, for example, without having to do, you know, whoops, without having to do this kind of garbage everywhere, right? Like nobody wants that. You can just paste verbatim code or anything and then you say done and it's very nice uh, way of doing this kind of thing. All right, so this gets pasted into the global scope of the program, right? And now this gets pasted, well, the body of this function to prepend is gonna get pasted into everybody, and then, but we're also gonna modify it. So we're gonna say name is some string called hello sailor, right? Note how much more code this is, first of all, than what we just did. Before we were doing the equivalent of one print statement and it took a sizable number of lines of code because we were explicitly building all the nodes. Here, we want to insert all this code in the target program. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compile this in a totally different workspace. And then remember how we get that array of all the statements that are in a procedure. That's how we were able to insert things in the first place, right? We added some things and then at first, and then we added all the original things, right? All the original statements. I'm saying things too many times. So um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to compile this as a completely standalone separate program that we're not even trying to build into an executable, but we just want to compile this so we can get to the syntax tree representing this code. Then we're going to yank those statements out of this function or procedure, right? It has side effects, so it's not a function. Um, we're going to yank the statements out of the procedure and then paste them into every other procedure. And then we're going to modify it a little bit in the process. We'll show that. Uh, but here's what we do is this is a placeholder for the name of the procedure. Uh, we don't ever actually print hello sailor, but that's a placeholder that we'll modify later. Um, we iterate from one to the indent level and we print spaces, right? And then we print these greater than, greater than, greater than, and then the name, right? Now we're gonna modify the name to be factorial or main or whatever the procedure name is, but this gives you all this code. Now, we also want stuff to happen at the end of the procedure, right? When we're about to exit, we want to decrement our index indent level, and we want to print that we're exiting. Now, we could do a very laborious thing where we scan the procedure and look for any returns or any other ways that we might exit the procedure, as well as, you know, the bottom of the procedure body, and then paste some amount of code at the end. That's very complicated, but we already have a way to do that automatically, right? We have this command defer, which you can give it a block and this block will run at the closing of the scope at the same time that destructors would run in a language like C++ or D. So uh, we give it all this stuff um, to defer. Someone's asking what if the procedure itself uses defer? How would it handle multiple defer blocks? They're just like destructors in that they go in reverse order of how they're introduced. Since this is going to get introduced before anything that the procedure uses, it's going to run last. So it'll run after that procedure's defers. Okay, so now let's look at, at the actual code. Let's look at for some version B. Now remember at the startup, remember the very first thing this file does is run this procedure build, right? And build when it starts up um, says if we're doing version B, do this thing where we compile and get a single procedure called to prepend. And that gives us a data structure for a procedure, right? So prepend proc is just this global for a code procedure, which is one of those things that holds the syntax tree that we just looked at before. So compile and get single procedure, let's look at that. Um, 
this is a thing in the compiler library where you give it the name of the procedure you want. This is made just to be totally quick and dirty, right? You give it the name of the procedure you want and you give it a bunch of strings and it'll concatenate all the strings together to make a program. We'll show you in a second why that's useful. Um, and then it compiles that program and it gets back all the declarations at the top level and all the procedures that were compiled, which may or may not be top level. And then we're just going to ignore those declarations. We're going to look through all the procedures for the name that you wanted and we're going to return that or we return null if we didn't find it. Okay, so now apparently all the magic happens in precompile. So let's look at that. And that should look very familiar at this point. Um, you know, we've got some arrays that we're going to put our return values into. We create a workspace. Um, we say we're not generating an executable on the workspace. Uh, I don't think I deleted a line. No, this, this buffer is not modified. <laughs> um, so we, we say that there's no executable name. Uh, maybe you meant the other buffer? No, that was this. Sorry, I'm listening to comments from the chat. Um, so uh, we say there's no executable in this workspace, we're just doing this for utility purposes. Now this, again, represents a completely empty program that will not interfere with any other program. So what we do is we add that string that we concatenated, we start intercepting, and we loop until we compile everything. And every time we get a procedure, we add that procedure to this array and we add the declaration to the array. So all we're doing is we're compiling a whole separate program and we're returning arrays of all the procedures. And then this thing is saying, okay, which one did you want, right? So uh, what we're doing here is we're saying, so down here is the startup code, right? Where we're saying compiler and get this single procedure that pastes together the global and the local code, right? So I'm really interested in this. This is what I want to compile in order to jam into everybody's code. But in order for that to compile, I also need this stuff because I'm referring to this variable from in here um, and I'm using these modules. So let's paste those together uh, and compile that as a separate program. Once I've done that, I stash it in prepend proc and then we go on, right? Now, how do we use prepend proc? Uh, version B. Now, now we're back in build steps, right, which is a function that we call, or procedure that we call. If coming from a C and C++ background, you say function for like all the time. And I'm trying to get out of the habit because it's not strictly correct. And it's important as we go into the multi-core future to distinguish between things that are a function versus things that aren't. So I'm trying to train myself to say procedure instead of function, but you know, I've got decades of training and it dies hard. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, in here we assert that our prepend proc is not null. Then again, we're going to do a similar thing to what we did last time. We've got this array of new statements that we're going to poke into the procedure. Now, instead of just synthesizing a print statement, we're going to just look at prepend, block, prepend proc's block and put every statement there into the new statements. So we're putting, uh, you know, all this stuff, we're ripping this out of this procedure and we're putting it in here. And then we're putting the blocks old statements and then we're poking that in just like before. Now we're doing one new thing here. Actually, let me comment out this next code. If that's all that we do, this should still work, but you're going to get that hello sailor in there. Uh, whoops, I keep running the wrong thing. History, there you go. Wait, what? Did I? I must have commented out the wrong thing. I hope I didn't break something. This is that moment where it's like, dun, dun, dun. Why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? I totally tested this before the stream. Maybe I did delete a line and somebody... It 
It's not even. Oh, it works fine. OK, see this? This is what I get for relying on my command history. I'm just compiling the demo file straight, right? And the reason I should know that is it's not even printing that it's creating a workspace, right? I need to, I went back too far in my history. I need to build setup. <laughs> OK, here we go. We're modifying both of these procedures. And now if I run it, uh, oh, because I re, OK. So now I want to go back and almost had a heart attack moment there. OK, so if that's all we do is paste that code onto the new code, and we don't do these next few steps, then, no, I ran the wrong thing again. Then, you know, it's because I switched from using Commander to using this prompt again, because Commander was unreliable and did horrible things to my system. And the up arrow works differently in terms of which command it puts you on. So I have muscle memory for the old thing. So if we don't do anything else, it thinks every procedure is called Hello Sailor, which is not that useful. So how do we get around that? Well, we know that the first thing that we're going to paste is a declaration, right? Because here we say name is being declared as the string Hello Sailor. Now, we assert here to make sure that we're not wrong. Like if we type some new code at the top, then uh, you know we might mess that up. But assuming that we're still correct, uh, we could also check the name that we're declaring if we wanted to. But here we just set the expression side of that declaration to be making the string literal of the procedure name. So we essentially replace this hello sailor with main or whatever it is. Right? So we're doing a little bit of the modification style that we did in version A, but in version B now. But the bulk of the work is this very quick and dirty, hey man, I just typed some code. Now once we've done this, we can use this as many times as we want. Uh, and that's pretty cool. All right, let's do something slightly more sophisticated. Again, since we built out all this infrastructure of compile single procedure and all that, um, compile and get single procedure. Uh, we can do uh, one hair more sophisticated. So let's do version C. And let's look at what that does. So if we go back down here to build at startup when we're doing version C, we're going to compile two different procedures, uh, prepend general and prepend main, right? And why would we do that? Well, it's because we want to do two different things. So uh, let's look at what those are. Uh, for version C, we've got an extra global variable that we're pasting into the target program. It's something called performance frequency, right? So now what we're going to do in the code to paste uh, general, this is what we're going to paste onto every procedure. It's very similar to last time. We start out with a name, hello sailor, that we're going to replace with the name of the procedure. We print an indent level, just like last time. We're going to print a different pattern, just because you know, I've been making mistakes today. So we might as well make sure we're really running version C. So instead of the greater than, greater than, greater than, we're going to have dash, dash, bracket. But then we print the name of the procedure anyway. We increase the indent level. Then we call query performance counter, which is a, a Windows API that gives us um, a relatively low-level CPU timer value. And that's in some units called ticks. And we're not even going to care what's the mapping from ticks to seconds or anything. We're just going to count ticks. So it's basically version B with a call to a timer at the end, right? Oh, oh actually, no, we do care about, sorry. We're not going to care yet. We will care eventually. Um, so on exit of the procedure, we remove the indent level or decrement the indent level. We draw our spaces. We get how many ticks we are at the end. Now we have an end ticks and a start ticks. So we call del say delta ticks, which is the amount of time that we spent between these two things. And uh, we convert this to seconds by dividing by this global performance frequency, right? And then we print how many seconds and how many ticks we spent in the function. So we went from something totally trivial and not that useful, like the printing the names of all the functions we're in, um, procedures we're in, and we've now gone to something that is giving us profiling data, right? Which is interesting because it's a profiler that we're building. OK. Um, Let's uh, now we're dividing by this performance frequency, which had better not be zero, which is what it will be when you start the program. So how do we set that up? Well, we're pasting slightly different code into main as well, right? So 
first we call query performance frequency, which initializes that value, right? That is the operating system giving us the mapping from the ticks to seconds. We're going to print that out, right? We're going to call time begin period, which is a stupid thing you do on Windows to make sure that you have reasonable timer resolution, right? Um, we're going to... Uh, why did I, I don't remember what I did here. Um, oh, right. Okay. Just to test our whether our performance frequency is correct, right? We're going to get some ticks. We're going to sleep for exactly one second, exactly one second, as close as that will reasonably happen on Windows. We're going to get more ticks. We're going to call delta ticks, and then we're going to figure out the microseconds, right? So, um, or milliseconds. I put USEC, but that is probably wrong. Anyway, whatever number it comes out to, it had better be a close to a round power of 10. Um, and let's just uh, see what that what happens when we do that. OK, so I did correctly turn on version C, right? And I've got more workspaces, because workspaces 2 and 3 were both used to build temporary programs. The demo itself is in number 4. And here we go. So. Tests demo.exe. Okay, so you notice it said the performance frequency. We delayed for one second, right? And then we said, okay, that took this many ticks and that many microseconds, which is very close to one million, but not quite because sleeping for exactly one second isn't quite something that happens in Windows. But that's pretty close, you know, for just calling sleep, right? Okay, so then uh, we're doing all this stuff just like before, where we enter main, we entered factorial, and then every time we exit factorial, we're printing how many seconds we spent in that routine. Okay, so that's interesting. We've got a homebrew profiler, and it didn't even take very much. In a lot of languages, getting this kind of info is difficult and requires you to modify your source code, right? Or instrument your binary. We didn't have to do either one, right? We can instrument uh, even uh, stuff in the standard library, for example. Um, we don't need write permission to the code to do this to it at all, right? We can just instrument anything. It'll work on any operating system because it's not a binary instrumentation. Uh, it'll work anywhere because it's part of, like part of the language spec is you have to be able to modify code in this way. So it's very, very powerful. However, um, this demo isn't super exciting yet. You know, we're just... You can maybe see the potential, right? If you're if you're a serious programmer, you can maybe see the potential. But I wanted to do something flashy with it. But first, before we do anything flashy, let's just show one thing that's kind of cool, um, which is uh, that uh, these, of course, compose. I don't just have to do one of these. So I'm going to, for example, jam all three of them on at once, right? Whoops, I, I compiled the wrong program. You want to see that? Okay. So we're modifying all three of these all three times, uh, which is cool. And now we're doing all this stuff, and it's a mess, right? But it's just to show that this is a general mechanism where you can compose different layers of these things. Um, what makes this more attractive than using call grind? It's way more, I'll show you in a second why this is way more attractive than using call grind. But you should be able to understand that what I'm showing right now is not a way to implement a profiler, a profiler, right? What I am showing is a way to generally do anything you want to your program. All right, that's very powerful. I'm using the profiler as an example to show something that you can't do in almost any other language. Okay, so um, I always like to take things one step further than this. So let's go back. Uh, to our little pro our uh, little Space Invader Galaga program. Now, as you recall, that has for a while had this front file where I defined things like go bananas. Um, so if I turn off go bananas, then it's just going to compile as normal, right? So this is uh, not very exciting. But I have this thing called do profiling where I've hooked in a profiler that is like, uh, well, it's a more advanced version of what we just saw. So let's, let's build that in, right? Uh, and then let's run it. 
uh.exe. Where does it go? Oh, it's in this folder. I'm a little bit inconsistent right now with where executables end up. Okay, so this is, as we saw before, hey look, it's this program. It's, you know, there's no surprise here. But I've hooked into it in a dastardly way such that when I press P, I get a profiler that tells me exactly what the program is doing, both in text form and graphically down here, right? So um, this is constantly running and collecting profiling data. Uh, this code isn't doing much right now because there's not that many invaders, but you know, I can zoom in here. Uh, I can, if, if I want to focus on uh, minimizing uh, runtime, well, let's, let's just look for a second. Um, those of you who, uh, who have used uh, something like this uh, in C or C++ called IPROF will know this. Uh, how this works very familiarly. Basically, I have a hierarchical, or I, I can sort my program in different ways. So right now I'm looking at all the procedures uh, sorted by self time, which is how much time you spend in that actual procedure, right? I can bop over here and sort by hierarchical time, which is uh, how, how much time is spent in that procedure and everybody it calls, right? Or I can sort by count, so like how many times did we call any particular procedure, which might give you ideas about what to inline or something, right? Now, oh, it's more gangster than this, man, believe me. This is the start. So uh, let's say we sort by hierarchical time and we go into this thing called invaders, right? We can sort of see a list of who that calls. Now, almost all the time, I'm running on a 30 hertz monitor right now because computers just are worse and worse as time goes on, and I can't get this monitor to sync faster than her 30 hertz. But, uh, you know, almost all that time is spent in swap buffers, which means we're waiting for vertical sync, and that's because this program isn't doing that much. So, let me recompile it with some different settings so that we c will have something to look at. Basically, we're going to jack the number of aliens and the number of particles, so it's totally ridiculous, and then uh, we're going to turn off playing sounds when aliens shoot bullets because when there's too many bullets, the sound is just crazy, right? So we're going to recompile. Whoops. Where is it? Okay. And then I'll try to survive, but there's too many aliens. Oh my god. Okay. So notice the ridiculous, like each thing has way more particles and all that. Now when I hit the profiler, I've actually got some user code that turns on my shield so I don't die. That's very useful, right? So now our code's doing a lot more. Um, stuff is flitter fluttering around on here because this list is, again, like I said, sorted. But we can press spacebar to freeze it at any point. So now we've got a lot of particle sources. So we're calling draw emitter a lot. So I can hit right arrow on here. That calls draw quad centered at, which calls draw quad. Here I can tell everybody who calls draw quad. So these are all parents of draw quad, right? I call it 25,000 times from this one routine and then a couple hundred times from these other places. So if I want to visualize what my program is doing, this is a pretty handy way of doing that, right? Now, um, uh, let's look back at, uh, well, invaders simulate, right? Which is called by invaders. So this is taking more time right now because there's so much stuff happening. Most of this program hasn't been written very efficiently. So we're calling, you know, a draw quad function for every little particle in every one of these, which is not how you would do it if you were trying to write a massively performant game. But for the purposes of getting this going quickly, it was fine, right? But that has performance penalties. So we look in here and we're drawing 121 particle emitters on this particular frame, right? And uh, that takes 12 milliseconds uh, hierarchically. So everybody we call takes 12 milliseconds, but this procedure itself even takes four milliseconds. So then we can pop in, okay, we draw 26,000 quads from there and etc. right? We can look into other stuff. What does invader simulate do? That takes almost nine milliseconds. Well, uh, we update our emitters, so that's different from drawing them. That's modifying the positions of all the particles. You can look at, oh, we're spawning new stuff, and we're simulating things. Oh, we're spawning 2,500 particles per second. That's interesting. Oh, the stream bitrate went down. Oh, God. Um, yeah, switch to a higher quality if you can't see, because 
Oh, I've got it on source, and I can't even read the text, guys. Um, well, the video on YouTube is going to be a lot better. <laughs> oh, Twitch. Twitch claims this is source. Maybe I've got my bitrate to... Yeah, anyway. Imagine that you can legibly read all the procedure names up on the corner there. Uh, <laughs> this is so ugly. I'm actually looking at the stream now, and it's terrible. Okay. Anyway, so you get the idea there. Now, I also um, I also have this graph view down at the bottom, like I was talking about. And if I want to focus, whoops, if I want to focus, or if I want to get rid of that, first of all. So you might notice that a significant amount of time here is still being spent drawing this graph. And that's because, you know, I didn't really optimize the profiler code that much either, because I just wanted to get ready for this demo. I'm calling like two GL, or six, six calls to GL vertex for every little line segment in each of these graphs and I'm drawing a ton of graphs it's insane right so that has a consequence in how many milliseconds it takes so if you look here we even are profiling the profiler right the profiler is part of the library that we didn't write so again I'm already doing things that I can't do uh, if, if I'm restricted to modifying user code Right? If I'm using something like iProf in C++, at first you usually don't have enough of these. What these are called in the C++ version is zones, right? So usually I don't have enough zones to give me the information I want. So to even get the information that I have here, I would have to define new zones and run and like, oh, that's still not enough. And, oh, that, and eventually after like 10 cycles of that, you pinpoint down where you really needed your zones. Here, I don't have to touch the source code. I have zones everywhere. Now you might want to avoid putting too many zones for performance reasons and I'll show you in a minute how that happens. Uh, but, uh, so that's cool. Now, if I want to focus on the graph, um, or if I want to get rid of the graph, right, I can get rid of it and then, you know, draw the, drawing the graph won't be in here anymore. If I turn it on, uh, well, I think I have to refresh this. Oh wait, no, it's a different function. Sorry, prof draw graph is a different function. So here you see it, it's above prof draw, uh, and now it drops way down. It's trivial, so it's dropped off the list. Now it comes back, right? Um, so I could focus on the graph. I can zoom in and out. Uh, oh, sorry, let me, um, yeah, I can zoom in and out on the graph. I can go way down. What is my program doing? Here I'm way down looking at the limit of my timer resolution, which is why everything is so quantized here, right? I'm probably not getting good profiling data in this area, um, but I can zoom back out to sort of the things that take more time. You know, here, here, I'm, here I'm back up toward top level. As I page around, uh, let, let me switch to here, yeah. So as I page around here in the list, he, here in the list, I'm trying to indicate with my cursor, if you can see that on the stream, then those also, that also controls what gets highlighted down here. Um, and I can also select things down here, right? So this is invade, let me stop this. I'll stop this when the line's over here so that we have something stable to look at. So, uh, right, that's invaders. I can select that. Uh, this is draw emitter. It took 13.16 milliseconds on this frame, but I can sort of slide around. Oh, 13.49, you know, 14.23. Uh, you know, I can, let me zoom in or a little bit. So I can s click this to select it on the top graph, right? So now we're, we're pinged in on that. Draw quad centered at is taking 9.18 milliseconds, right? I can pick that. So I've got this good interactivity back and forth between these two displays. You can look at particular things at particular times. Like if you wanted to start investigating why your program had certain behavior, it's like, oh, look, swap buffers. Well, swap buffers isn't a good example because we don't have much visibility into that. Uh, prof draw graph takes more time sometimes than other times. So um, if we wanted to, instrument that further. I'll show you how we could do that. If we wanted to, we could get more information at the times when there's more spikes. Let's find something at, at the level of R code. So like we have big spikes here in the font drawing, although that's going to be all <laughs> basically a lot. Okay, simulate bullet. Okay, here's an interesting one. Um, for some reason, we had this spike out of nowhere. Um, and 
this might be a thing where we coordinate with other more system level profiling tools because we're, we're looking here and we're like, oh my God, there's this giant spike. We don't have that many bullets happening, right? So either we invoked a memory allocation or, you know, we hit something, that, a page that was out of core or something bad happened, right? So you can pinpoint this, you know exactly what time it happened. Um, probably a future extension to this code would involve not just profiling time, but allocations. So you could see if extra allocations happened or something. Anyway, so you can browse around your code. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention is that just like before, we can also browse our source this way, right? So, oh, draw temporary glyphs. Where's that? It'll pop to our editor, right? Uh, find or create glyph. Where's that? Pop to our editor. Zoom way down in the program. Make page aug, which is part of the audio system. There it is, right? So we just have this nice inspection ability. And, okay, so again, um, this is going to be supplied as part of the standard library, right? Um, and if you want to hack it and customize it for your own thing, you can. If you want to just use the stock standard library profiler, you can. But regardless, it'll work this way on every operating system uh, because it's just like part of the, like the language spec is all such that this will work, right? Because it only relies on, um, you know, uh, those messages working, which are a very low level functionality of the compiler, and your ability to draw stuff on the screen, which you're going to have because diff different parts of the standard library are going to supply that and be ported to every operating system. So you won't need a third party thing like SDL to open a window, right? And profiler is going to work. So let's, is there any questions? Are there any questions about what I've just shown? I'm going to look at the implementation in a minute. So let's not ask about how this is implemented, but if there's other questions about what the heck are we looking at, then uh, ask those. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Non-sarcastic questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about the streaming. I might have... Um, my local streaming settings might not be the best either, in which case I hope my uh, local recording is of higher fidelity. Uh, what about the communication I do between Emacs and the compiler? That is very easily dropped in from user level. I'll show you how that happens. It's one line that you can replace, or a couple of lines. Have I considered how this might interact with hot code swapping? I haven't thought too much about hot code swapping. Um, I think it's a very feasible thing to do, especially in this language, because this language is very clean and works hard to communicate with outside systems. Uh, so we'll do uh, hot code swapping at some point, but I'm more focused right now on defining the actual language. Looks great, but is there anything profiler related planned for non GUI programs? If you can do all this stuff that I just did, a batch profiler like you get on the command line in some operating systems like Linux or whatever is trivial. Like compared to this, it's so easy. So we'll probably have one, but you could write one and it's fine. Like you just don't, it's just not a problem. Um, is someone's asking, is the standard library going to be an abstraction over the OS and windowing system? Will you be able to do OS specific things? Yes, you will. In fact, I do. For example, when I called query performance counter, that is not an abstraction, right? That is a direct call to the OS. And you can do that all the time. What I'm demoing today is sort of a mixture of calls that are abstracted and calls that are not abstracted simply because the abstraction layer uh, is not defined yet. And, you know, I want to make demos and stuff. So uh, I feel free to call directly to the operating system where I think that'll be useful. Now, um, I do plan to provide uh, good abstractions for uh, opening windows, drawing graphics, playing sound, all that stuff. However, you're always going to want to go beyond those if you're a serious enough programmer and either modify them or make your own. So you'll have source code to all that and you'll be able to change it however you want, but you'll also be able to just use it out of the box the way this profiler does. Will I have stuff like cache misses in the reporting? I hope so. Um, this is just something that uh, that I threw together for this demo, right? This is uh, so. 
Uh, iProf is a thing that Sean Barrett wrote that you can get from his website. It's a single file library for C, or it's actually not single file, but it's a relatively easy f library to integrate for C and C++. Um, and that is based on some code that I did a really long time ago, or it, it, most of the code is now his, but he sort of started with the thing and made it a lot more uh, sophisticated. So I've just taken what he did and then built on it some more and ported it. Now, um, that, that code was mostly concerned just with timing, but if you wanted to get more detailed uh, statistics from the operating system, uh, like cache misses or anything like that, then as long as you had a good interface for collecting those stats, you could do it. Um, you know, there's various uh, finessing that you can do about how to do that kind of stuff without interfering so much with your program, but uh, it's all doable. You know, it's not too bad. Does the compiler run Doom yet? It Not yet, but it could pretty straightforwardly. Can I pause running the main loop from the debug, or does the program have to be running for the debug code? Um, I could instrument main, like I can do anything to the program that I want. So I can insert a hook into main that lets me stall it and call out to something else. That may not be that good of an idea to do it that straightforwardly based on what the program does. But actually you'll see some other ways that are interesting in which I modify the program. Because I, I had to draw this somehow if you think about this, right? All this profiling stuff that I can bring up and down, like it has to be drawn after all the invaders. So I somehow inserted into the middle of the program something to draw all this. So we're going to look at that now. Um, does user code run at compile time have access to the sizes of structs? Um, I'm not Sure. Like I said, it's kind of trivial to do that. Um, I'm not sure if I do right now, honestly, because um, I've just done a ton of stuff lately. Um, it's quite possible that that's the case. Uh, if not, it can be made to be the case. What if I have some compile time instrumentation code and then you import a library that was already instrumented? There is a presumption um, that importing a library that is already instrumented makes sense. Uh, that probably doesn't make sense because we don't have pre-compiled binary libraries in the way that C++ does because I think that only introduces problems. How will this impact debugging? Uh, we may go into that in a different, um, a different time, but basically there's an option in the compiler to save out... So if you add things as strings the way that we did in the beginning there, right? Then the compiler will save out into a temporary file all the strings that were added for a given program, which and then annotate the uh, the actual nodes with those locations. So in those cases where uh, let's go back to um, where was it in uh, in setup, right? Remember when we were pasting this kind of code, right? Um, we were pasting it out of a string. Actually, in this particular case, yeah, what will happen is we'll get an added string for this entire program, because remember we concatenated strings and then compiled them. So we would get a temporary file representing that whole program, and then the nodes that we pull out of here actually will have debugging info that points to those file and lines. So you will be able to find that code in the debugger. However, the way we did it in version A, you wouldn't be able to because we were just constructing nodes and we weren't really setting file in line because there's no source code that corresponds to them, which is another reason to do it this way, right? I, I wanted to show the version A way to, uh, to show how things work underneath, but this is more debuggable by far. Okay. So uh, let's get down to business then and look at, oh, I forgot to show a feature. Okay, let's show one more feature. So I said that all this is done without instrumenting the code and that is true. However, you can uh, do things within the code if you want, right? So. Uh, here, when we compiled, see how I'm printing that we're skipping things due to a no profile note uh, in various places? Let me go to a place that has that. So let me go to math, right? 
if you remember the demo back where you could add notes onto things, right? We've put notes on a few of these. Uh, and these sort of basically say are hints that say, you know, um, you probably don't want to profile this uh, because it's a really small routine that gets called a lot. Now, these actually may not be necessary um, in these particular things because you might have a heuristic that rejects routines that are too small anyway, which we'll show in a second. You're also free to ignore this if you want at user level, uh, but I wanted to demo the functionality. So if there was a thing that you didn't want to profile for some other reason, like for example, maybe the timing in that routine is very sensitive because it's doing some kind of like lock free thing and you just don't want code messing with it, then you can also tag that no profile or whatever. Okay, so let's go to, uh, let's look at how this was implemented. Um, it, uh, it is, like I said, a more sophisticated version of the demos we were showing where we just printed stuff. So we call build. This is the same build proc that we uh, demoed last time, right? Uh, where we call process build events and all that stuff. The bananas is for that whole graphical music playing compiler display. Um, so we're calling process build events. And we've added a line here for every event that says, hey, if it's not our workspace, maybe add profiling to it. And that, I believe, is in a different file. It's in here, right? So if do profiling is turned off, we ignore the message. If we already injected the final profiling code, we ignore the message. This is a thing, our profiler has multiple steps, right? So we want to inject code into every procedure that we want to modify. And then we also want to inject a non-trivial amount of stuff into the global scope. Some of that non-trivial amount of stuff is going to be record keeping for all the profiling zones where we're storing all the data. And once we've done that, if for some reason other code comes through, we don't want to generate profiling for it because we've already allocated the zone data. It should be, uh, this should not happen if you set things up correctly, but you might make a mistake, right? And instead of, uh, you know, like you might have some other modifier after profiling that keeps adding stuff. And if I want this to be an error or a warning, I could report an error or warning here, but for now I'm just silently ignoring anything, right? So what do we do? Well, um, let's, uh, if we get a compilation phase message, those are the messages that say, for example, all our code is parsed. Now we're going to start building the executable. Then we do a bunch of stuff. This stuff will make more sense after we talk about the other stuff. So we're going to skip it for now. So now we're saying, okay, again, we're looking for code type check messages. Um, we'll look at those. We only care about certain kinds that declare procedures that are not foreign or not compile time, right? If it's foreign and it's implemented in, in C or something, we can't modify it by definition because it's an external thing, right? I mean, I suppose we could make a wrapper around it, but we're not attempting to do that right now. Um, if it's compile time, we probably don't want to mess with it because it's doing something really important. Um, okay, then we look at the notes. If there's a no profile note on it, then we skip it, right? We could choose not to do that here. Whatever, we skip it. Uh, if it's a polymorphic procedure, we don't instrument it because that'll cause problems. If it's not obvious why that would cause problems, we'll get into it in the Q&A. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, then we have, OK, so this is basically library code that we're looking at right now, right? If you want to use the profiler library to instrument your code, you're calling this. We also call out to a user level hook, which is um, defined by the person who sets up the profiler. So that is back here. So let's look at where that happens. So we define this procedure called should instrument that does a bunch of decision making, right? And then this is pretty long. And then, so, so we're at start a workspace here, right? So we're starting a workspace that builds the target program. We could even do multiple of this. All this stuff that we're doing, we could do separately to debug and release executables at the same time. Remember, we demoed that last time. So if we're doing profiling, then 
we say init iprof instrumentation with this should instrument procedure, and then some other things defining user level code. So now we're going to get to that question about how do you, you know, how do you do stuff uh, that that's custom, right? Like how do you define your editor and how the profiler should open your editor when you click? You have to do that somehow, and it can't really be in the library because you want to interface with many editors, right? That the profiler library doesn't even know about. So this is a way that we do that. Okay, so first, um, we're doing some things. So in the GL routine, we want to be careful about what we hook. Uh, so um, basically, if it's one of these uh, things that you really want to know about, then uh, we return true. So certain things in the profiler, we say, Oh, this is not the GL library. Sorry, I misspoke. It's the profiler's GL interface, right? Like if you made a display routine for Direct3D or Vulkan or something, it would be a different file here because you've got the part of the profiler that does the back end work and the part that does the front end work. So if it's part of the profiler that does the front end work, um, we only care about certain things because otherwise, if you're not careful about this, you might make a recursive uh, loop where the profiler tries to call itself, and that's never any good. Um, uh, basically, anything in the basic library we're going to ignore, um, because again, uh, our profiler makes allocations. And so if we accidentally implement alloc or something, um, that's bad. Now, we do actually want to hook alloc, though, for later implementations. Uh, so this is left as a thing to figure out and structure around so it doesn't become a problem probably by not dynamically allocating in the profiler, but we'll see. There's other ways to do that too. Um, okay. Now we say if the procedure is small, we're going to ignore it. So all that stuff that had no profile, we're going to ignore anyway, right? So this expression count is something we showed last time, but basically if there's not that many expressions in the procedure, that's one hint that it's small and that if we add profiling onto it, then we're probably adding too much bloat to it and that would be a bad idea so uh, let's not do that um, but then i wanted to have an example of at user level ignoring something so say suppose something that you do there's something you don't want to profile but it doesn't have a no profile note and you don't want to or cannot modify the source code you just make an exemption for it here you say oh there's this procedure make vector two if something's called that don't profile it right so we skip it we can skip entire files so this stuff has threaded stuff this profiler doesn't work multi-threaded yet it'll be pretty straightforward to make it work multi-threaded provided that your operating system gives you reliable per thread count performance counters. Uh, if it doesn't, then you can sort of put a global performance counter per thread, which gives you a lot of information, but may be misleading at some times. So for now, to keep it simple, all this other stuff that I know is on other threads, uh, we're ignoring, but it doesn't even matter because in the profiling code that we inject, we also ignore other threads. We'll show that. Um, and then in the body of the profiler, we'll put a hook in update, but again, to avoid recursive situations, we'll ignore everything else. Anyway, that's my quite involved hook that I wrote at user level, but I can replace this with anything else that I want. Uh, I can literally only profile routines that contain the letter E if I care. Uh, okay. Um, now, down here, um, when we init the instrumentation, we give it a couple of procedures to call. We give it the name of something to call every frame and we give it the name of something to call when we want to invoke the editor. We also tell it what font we want to use because we need to include font data uh, with the profiler for the profiler to be able to draw a font. So we tell it what font file that we're packaging with it. Um, but let's look at this stuff. Uh, so we have a per frame hook and an editor hook and where do those happen? Well, they just happen up here in this string called uh, iprof hook code right? We, we've just got these two things, per frame hook and editor hook. And where that happens, before we look at what those specifically do, I prof hook code. Um, oh, right, we do it right here. So we, we have our procedure that makes all these choices about what to instrument. 
we call iProf, and then into that workspace that, that we're operating on, we also just add this code because the profiler can add code, but we could add code too, right? And it's very easy, in fact, to add code at the global namespace. We just call add build string. So add build string uh, adds this hook code. Whoops, I'm going too far. So per frame, iProf will call this routine. And here we just, we happen to know, because we wrote the source of the game, how to make ourselves invincible while the profiler is up. We just say, OK, uh, the, give ourselves three seconds of invincibility every frame uh, that the profiler is up, which will keep us continuously invincible. And then when we take the profiler down, we'll have three seconds before we get destroyed. right? So. Uh, that's good. Let me check the volume. I just got paranoid that like maybe I wasn't audible. Um, and then when we call the editor, the profiler will call this thing with a file in line, right? So here I define what program I want to run and what the arguments are. And then I call some standard library thing called run external program that will have some implementation on every operating system. Now, if I want to run an external program in a more detailed and specific way, I can always do an operating system specific call here. But here I've just chosen to use an abstraction. And I'm, I'm printing out what command we're going to run, which is where uh, this stuff came from, this Emacs client, whatever and I'm running it. So those are custom things that I can drop into the program and have the profiler call, right? So it's a very nice and straightforward way of, of interfacing and customizing with what happens. All right, so let's look at the rest of it. Um, because when we actually instrument, we do two things. We, well, we do three things. <laughs> Uh, let's look at this. So we've decided to instrument stuff. We're continuing on from where we were before. Remember, we looked for the no profile note. We decided this was a kind of message we care about. We looked for no profile. And now we're going on. Um, we compiled two functions, prepend general and prepend main, because main wants to initialize our profiler, and then general is what we append to everybody else that wants to use it. Just like before, we have some new statements. Um, if we're instrumenting main, we put prepend main on there, right? Then we put prepend general. Uh, we mark the declaration of the zone name, just like before, because we're going to modify the name for every procedure, right? Um, then we put those statements into the block, and we uh, we modify the block. Uh, and, well, first we change the name, just like before. Uh, if we don't change the name, we're going to get hello sailor again. Uh, and then we modify the block, right? So that's all fine. Now. Um, let's look at prepend main and prepend general. Uh, so prepend general, um, if you were wanting to be maximally fast, you would dump all the code for beginning and ending a profiling zone into this. But I've just put in procedure calls. Uh, I could do this, except that Inlining isn't real yet because we don't have a real backend yet. But uh, you could inline these at the call site uh, just to keep things tidy. Uh, but anyway, I'm just calling out to another procedure rather than pasting a ton of stuff here. But I call a prof begin, right? And I defer calling prof end. And prof begin, just like um, just like before, uh, basically starts a timer and prof end finishes the timer. Now, it's actually, I lied. I said we were modifying the name, but that's not true. We're modifying the zone index because we want to be able to modify a, a global array of timings very quickly. So we use an index, and then we emit the, nap, the mapping of names to indexes later, and that's a different table that we'll look at. Um, then at the beginning of main, we want to init the runtime, and that's a different thing. So let's look at those really fast. Prof init runtime. Oh, uh, and here, okay, <laughs> so here we add stubs for all those, which just like before, we're making this compile as a complete program. Um, I'm not calling print from here or anything, so I don't need to import any modules. I just have stubs for all these. These don't matter. I ignore them. I grab this stuff just like before, and I paste it into my procedures. Now, uh, in, in the actual iProf code, is the versions of these that are going to actually end up in the target program. So if I go prof 
uh, init runtime. That's this thing that, you know, we've got this zone array and caches and there's all kinds of implementation details we're not going to care about. Uh, but we do a bunch of initialization from main, right? And then we call prof begin from within uh, a particular zone. And that, you know, it makes sure we're in the main thread. Uh, it makes sure that we uh, haven't made a, an error, right? And then we do all this stuff. These thread notes are just my personal notes that like, look, this is a thing that you have to think about when you do the multi-threaded version, which we haven't done yet. Um, anyway, other than that, this is analogous to what was happening before. Uh, it's just doing a little bit more complexity. This prof cache is a way of handling recursion, right? Because if you just throw the timestamps into a flat array by zone index, then you're going to overwrite those as you go into the same zone multiple, multiple times. So the cache like, is a way of giving us a separate place to put information if we're recursing into a thing multiple times. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at, while we're on this topic, let's look at, are people getting lost or is this making any sense? Am I just like rambling on and on with no end in sight or is this okay? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong file. I have no idea how much people are following or if they're talking about the election or what. Um, Now this thing that we skipped over before uh, generates the mapping of names to, uh, to zones and does some other initialization code that's dynamically generated based on how many zones there are. And I'm going to print that out uh, because this is also stuff that we generate. Oh, my console isn't quite wide enough. <laughs> so. Uh, let me let me set the console to be wider. Layout uh, 160, 180. I don't know. Is that wide enough? That's too wide. Okay. Anyway, so uh, one little janky thing about the language right now is because it's not that important uh, compared to features of this magnitude. I haven't implemented array literals. So one thing that we do in main is we call that init profiler, and profiler calls init zone names through which we just emit this spew of code that uh, basically initializes a global array. We should be emitting an array literal, but I don't even have syntax for array literals. So one at a time we say, okay, there's zone two, zero. It's the global zone. Here's the hash of the name in case we want that. This is a CRC64, right? Here's what file name it's located in, which is none, right? Here's what line number. For the rest of these, which are pulled out of the program, we have files and line numbers, right? So we have CRC64s for the names if we want them. Um, these are in WAV file, right? And there's the path that the file is in and there's the line number it's in, right? So we initialize all this stuff at startup um, and that's the good action. So this is how we display all that information uh, as we were navigating around the program. Um, this is actually better than the C version of IPROF because the C version of IPROF computes hashes at runtime. Uh, with a poorer hash function, in fact. But because we're doing this at compile time, we can use a more expensive hash function that's higher quality. And at runtime, we don't care. It's just packed right there in the zone. So that's all great. Um, OK. Now, uh, there's one last thing that I want to show, which is what we do for special places like uh, Okay, so in addition to instrumenting stuff, we do this thing called hook idents, which looks for very special procedures and figures out, this is the way that the profiler hooks its display and keyboard reading code into the main procedure, right? So like when I was hitting keys, the profiler was intercepting those and responding to them. And how does that work? Well, that happens here. And this is a thing where the profiler would have to adapt this to any API that you're using for input or, um, or rendering, or perhaps you would tell the profiler what to hook and how. But for now, it's hard-coded. So 
what we do is we go through the whole procedure. And uh, I said that at this phase in compilation, you can verify that things are bound to what you think they are. But I'm not even doing that. Uh, I'm being lazy and just hooking by name, whatever. In reality, you would want to verify that this is the get next event that, that is in the standard library. Um, but I say, if the identifier of something we're calling is get next event, change it to iprof get next event. And if it's swap buffers, uh, and it's not a swap buffers in iprof gl, we call prof update and draw. The reason why we do this is because prof update and draw calls swap buffers. <laughs> so again, if we don't exempt the one in iprof gl, we'll get an infinite loop. Okay. Uh, but uh, let's go look at those. Let's look at the update and draw first, because that's simpler. So here we init the font if it's not initialized already. Then we do define a bunch of stuff about where the profiler is going to get drawn. We have some procedures for printing text. And if the display is visible, which it may or may not be, if we haven't hit P, then we call some prof draw function, which we won't go into, but it does all that cool stuff. Then we call the graph, right, if that's visible. Then we call underscore swap buffers, right? The reason we call underscore swap buffers is because we do want to be able to profile this. Because remember when I was, um, when I was, uh, looking through the profile, it was important to know if we were spending most of our time waiting on swap buffers or something else. And if you don't let yourself profile swap buffers at some point, then uh, you just won't know if that's happening. It'll be very confusing. So we broke this into a separate routine so it gets its own zone. It's very clear. Um, if I wanted to really make sure that user level code doesn't skip this, maybe I say yes profile or something, but that isn't something we did for this demo. Uh, and then iprof get next event is pushed in front of get next event, right? This is wrapped around it as a hook um, where we get a next event. Uh, we, we, or we call the basic library's next event, right? If there isn't one, then we return zero, right? If it's not a keyboard event or a text input event, we don't care. We return it, right? Uh, if it's text input, we toggle whether we're visible. So we're always intercepting the P key, whether we're up or not, because that's how we toggle our visibility. Um, then if we're not visible, we return whatever event the application was going to get anyway. We don't interfere with it at all. Uh, but if, if we are visible, then we go on and intercept some more things. So if it's spacebar or minus or equals, you know, we do zooming stuff or we navigate back and forth by frames. If it's a keyboard event, I hooked a bunch of function keys to do all these controls, right? So that's all arbitrarily elaborate code. And then because we intercepted those events, we returned zero. So the user level code thinks there's no event, right? So it won't respond. You don't want the user level code responding to F11 if you just wanted to make the graph bigger, but the user level code thought F11 was open the editor or something. That would be a mess. So you intercept that stuff. Um, and this is great because you can do all this at source code level. Uh, most tools that do instrumentation like this do it at a binary level, most serious tools anyway, which means they're specific to particular operating systems and particular chips, uh, you know, particular machine languages. This will work everywhere because it's happening at source code, right? This is the kind of thing that very few languages allow you to do, like, you know, maybe Lisp allows you to do this. Possibly some implementations of Lisp allow you to do this. Uh, a lot of the times you'd have to use a macro everywhere. Uh, but then, um, you know, Lisp doesn't have static type checking or all sorts of other things that are very valuable. So we're getting the best of both worlds here. We're getting very high level abilities and we can see our program at a very, very low level, right? This is as low level as C. It's lower level than C++ in many cases. So we're spanning a very broad range of expressiveness, low to high, which I think is important, right? For many years, the ideas about high level languages are, oh, we leave the low level behind and we just go high, high, high. But that's a mistake because you end up with something that performs very poorly, that uh, you lose understanding of what is happening in the program and all sorts of stuff. So if you keep the ability to drill down arbitrarily low, I think that this is very valuable, right? You can 
uh, again, because all this happens at the source level, you can customize it. If you don't like exactly how this profiler display is, you can just copy the ProfGL module and make your own and make it work however you want. Uh, and that's all great. So I think this is all that I want to say as a main uh, thing. I might have forgotten something important. Uh, I spent the last hour before this talk making sure audio was working, and I ended up failing and going back to this terrible microphone that has bad audio quality. Hopefully by next time, actually before next stream, I will have an entirely new desktop machine, which brings some hope that audio will actually work. So uh, let's take any further questions so that I can stop rambling and we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Does any of this make sense? Does all of it make sense? Is something in particular confusing? Let me know.